This morning we are here with Steve McConnell, senior pastor at the Church in the Palms in Sarasota, Florida, and author of the book, Take Me, Take Me to Aslan, C.S. Lewis, and the Art of Trusting. And we're going to have a conversation about the Chronicles of Narnia, a series of children's books written by C.S. Lewis in order to understand the background of the story and their author. Steve, last time we left off talking about the power of relationships. So take us through Lewis's life and tell us about his relationship, relational world and how that impacted him and as well how it shaped this, his writing of the Chronicles. Let's start with his family. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, well, as we had said uh, in our last episode, um, Lewis uh, was born in Belfast, and um, he, uh, you know, probably had a very traditional family, uh, mother and father. Actually, Lewis's grandfather was a was a pastor, so uh, that in part was an influence in his life. His mother's father was a pastor in Belfast. So actually, had been to that church. Uh, where he was the pastor, and Lewis went to church there for uh, for many many years uh, as a child. Was baptized there, um, and uh, as as I said earlier, he uh, his mother uh, was I think a, a great influence, a great comforting maternal influence in his life, and his father, uh, perhaps very traditionally, was more the distant father. He was the one who kind of you know. Um, gave over the raising of the children to the mother and didn't necessarily engage as much in uh, the raising of the, of the two boys, Warney and, and uh, Jack. What we, uh, what we learned through further uh, reflections on Lewis later in his life was um, that uh, not only were, was he somewhat distant, but um, for both boys, they just really had a difficult time relating to him. Um, uh, he, he, he couldn't understand their world. He didn't really appreciate their imagination, didn't really appreciate their play. Um, he was a lawyer. He was a barrister in, uh, in the city. And, um, and so we kind of thought in those terms and he didn't necessarily uh, give himself over to um, the participation in childhood as it were. So uh, over time, that relationship, you know, probably grew further and further apart which then, of course, came to a head when Lewis's mother died at the age, uh, at his age of nine. Warney was three years older, and so when he was uh, 12. And uh, so this really kind of magnified the dysfunction, uh, dysfunctional relationship between the boys and their father, and perhaps was one of the um, driving forces for Albert, the father, to send the boys off to school because he just did not feel that equipped to be a parent. And, and like I said, I, I don't know that that might have been much different from any of the other uh, traditional families, you know, in, in Belfast of that day. But it, uh, it truly was uh, an interruption in Lewis's relational world and one that he, you know, had to sort of, you know, work out throughout his life. Um, and uh, interesting thing in terms of the death of his mother um, when uh, Lewis died uh, in, on, this, on November 22nd, 1963, same time, the same day that JFK was shot, same day when Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World, passed away, all three died on the same day. Uh, uh, Warney, the surviving brother, um, had Lewis buried in the little uh, graveyard of the local Episcopal, the local Church of England, Holy Trinity Church. And the, the, the slab that he put on top of Lewis's grave, uh, under which he himself was buried as well, Warney, um, he, they put, he put a quote from Shakespeare's, uh, from King Lear that says, men must endure their going hence. And what's interesting about that is that that was the quote on the Shakespeare calendar that their mother had, and it was the quote that was on the day of her death. So for whatever reason, they had held on to that, you know, that quote, held on to that page, and as a perhaps a way to signify to us what a significant event that was for both of them, that at the end of their life, um, Warney thinks to put this quote on top of 
Lewis's tombstone, men must endure their going hence. So, um, so that's the, you know, that's that first chapter in Lewis's relational world that, um, that begins to sort of set the course for his maybe yearning for significant relationships in the future. Okay, thank you. How about his schooling? How was he influenced by the relationships he had with his different teachers? Well, uh, I alluded to some of this in the in the earlier um, in the earlier episodes, but uh, Lewis uh, again he's sent off to a boarding school. And he, he couldn't be sent off to probably a worse place than um, his uh, than the uh, Cherbourg score in, in Winyard, which is uh, led by this uh, tyrannical headmaster named Robert Capron, who was affectionately called Oldie. And, uh, you know, pretty much close to the outset of being there, Lewis was writing letters back to his father saying, I, I don't want to be here. And I'm sure likely he missed home, but then he was just really suffering under the this man who would just fly off into a rage and would, you know, beat desks with uh, rulers and, uh, you know, verbally abuse his, his students. Later, he was found to be insane uh, and they had to close the school down after um, Lewis's father had taken them out. But that left uh, that in, in essence, that relationship, that influence really stagnated Lewis's education because, um, you know, he was already a, a incredibly brilliant child. And um, and really what he needed was somebody to sort of uh, fan that flame and allow that imagination and, and intelligence to thrive. But that was not going to be the environment. He got passed off to a couple of other boarding schools, both in England and Ireland, and none of them really seemed to do the trick. And in, in the one school, Malvern College, he was um, he was bullied by uh, his fellow students. Again, he was not a he, he didn't participate in sports and didn't participate in lots of boy things, and um, and so he was made fun of uh, throughout a, a good part of his education, which made it more and more difficult. Now, on the other hand. Uh, it was at the Malvern School where he was uh, taken under the wing of um, one of the, the uh, matrons of the school, uh, a woman by the name of Miss Cowie. And um, she really nurtured Lewis. In fact, almost became a mother figure for him. And, uh, and he really you know, thrived under that relationship and her encouragement. Um, the tragedy of that whole story is that um, the administration of the school began to see and, and feel as if that relationship had crossed some boundaries mm. um, that um, for for the teacher, for Miss Cowie. And so uh, she was immediately fired. So all of a sudden now this mother figure is taken away from him again. Uh, in a more positive vein, um, there was another teacher in the school, uh, a teacher they called Smoogie. And uh, he was perhaps the one who really understood the potential that Lewis had as a young boy and really nurtured him in, in his love for poetry, his love for literature, his uh, ability to critique literature and, uh, and interpret it. All of that was encouraged by this uh, this teacher that they called Smoogie and and you know kind of uh, fanned that flame that was slowly and slowly being extinguished. You know he was the one that began to to fan that flame some more. And then finally, uh, Lewis um, you know prevails upon his father that you know there needs to be something else you know from from my education. And that's when Lewis uh, turned to this old teacher. That's when uh, Lewis's father turned to his old teacher. W.T. Kirkpatrick, who was had been retired from school and was living at home with his wife, and he prevailed upon W.T. Kirkpatrick to take Lewis into his home and to be his basically his personal tutor. Uh, There's a wonderful story that you know again Lewis you know, gets put onto a ship, sent, you know sent across the sea and then you know ends up in this home. Uh, he goes get gets put on a train. You know he, he finds the train himself. This is like a 15 year old boy, and then he. Makes his, he makes the train right up to where Kirkpatrick lived. And he gets off the train and there is this, you know, this, um, this 
old man, um, you know, who's, you know, somewhat, um, you know, intimidating for this, this young boy. And they take this walk back to their house. And Lewis recalls, you know, talking about how, you know, aren't the, aren't the flowers lovely or isn't this a beautiful day? And immediately W.T. Kirkpatrick begins to sort of prevail upon him, you know, the, the, the need to develop a logical argument. So he starts to say, well, what is it? You know, why do you, what possesses you to think that this is a beautiful day? What is it about beautiful that makes you think that this is a beautiful day? And he, and, you know, this young boy is just, you know, he thought he was just trying to, you know, pass off a, a nice polite remark and already he was being instructed. But as I said earlier, this was a, this was a match made in heaven because uh, Kirkpatrick really understood the mind of this young boy and uh, developed this rigorous schedule every day that he would read and he would be examined and he would um, he would have time to re reflect and you do his own reading. And it, it, you know, it was like rain in a desert. And uh, before you know, anyone knew it, you know, this young boy was flowering. And uh, it really goes to show uh, how important those kinds of relationships are mm -hmm. in our life. You know, those that really see us for what our potential is, as opposed to, you know, trying to make us conform to their own preconceived notions as to who we should be. And that's exactly what W.T. Kirkpatrick becomes. And we'll talk later when we get to the Lion, the Witch and Wardrobe, that, that a character, W.T. Kirkpatrick actually ends up as a important character in the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay, you've covered the, his family, his teachers. Now, what about his friends? Yeah, and um, you know, one probably needs to think about Lewis's friends in a couple of different categories. Uh, I'll talk about sort of his earlier relationships, uh, and then later on, we'll talk perhaps about his um, his the relationships that he has with his colleagues. Uh, but Lewis, uh, you know, had a very significant friendship when he was young. As I mentioned, you know, Lewis liked to stay at home and um, and uh, he didn't necessarily develop a lot of good friends in his neighborhood. There turned out to be one boy who lived across the street, Arthur Greaves, that he had never really engaged much with when he was growing up. But uh, on one holiday when he came back from school, uh, you know, this is back when he was in his early teens, um, he learns from his father that the boy across the street was himself sickly and in bed. And wouldn't it be nice if you know, young Jack would go over and, um, and visit him? And sure enough, he goes over to visit this boy, Arthur Greaves. And he finds there on his little bed stand um, next to his bed, this uh, pile of books. And they're all the books that Lewis loves. And primarily they're about Norse mythology and um, all those great ancient tales that uh, Lewis didn't ever imagine that anybody loved as much as he did, but this young boy does. And it sets off this um, incredible relationship of friendship that they had until their dying days. Um, Lewis died before Arthur did. Um, Lewis died when he was just shy of 65. I'm not quite sure how long Greaves lived past that, but they remained um, the best of friends over that period, even though uh, Arthur remained in Ireland for his whole life, and Lewis lived in England. Back and forth, they would go, and uh, and they exchanged just hundreds and hundreds of letters over that course of time. In fact, there's a collection of uh, of uh, there's a book that has a collection of just the letters between um, just the letters of Lewis to Arthur Greaves. So that was a very, um, it was sort of an anchor relationship for Lewis over the course of his life that it's one that he always kind of came back to. In fact, we have a couple of letters of Lewis to Arthur Greaves where he really basically outlines how he came to faith. Um, interestingly enough, Greaves was not a believer and, and didn't become a believer over the course of that time. Uh, he was gay. So there was, a, there was you know, a lot of... Uh, parts of their life that didn't necessarily match. But nevertheless, they this was one of those childhood relationships that was destined for a lifetime and really became for Lewis a real anchor in his in his life. Take uh, an entirely different relationship, which set the course for Lewis, which was this fast friendship, as I mentioned earlier, that he had with Patty Moore, 
uh, when they were, uh, you know, early students at Oxford, just prior to being shipped off to World War I, uh, they set off such a fast friendship that they made this uh, bond to, with each other and, and promised to each other that they would, that if one survived and the other one didn't, that the one who survived would take care of the remaining parent. Um, that really kind of set the course for Lewis in respect to the fact that uh, from there, and Lewis has returned from the war and Patty's not, Lewis uh, developed this next relationship with uh, Patty Moore's mother, Mrs. Moore. And uh, that became um, a, uh, a relationship that lasted about 30 years. They lived together. Um, and, um, and it was a it turned out to be a problematic relationship for Lewis because Mrs. Moore became a bit tyrannical in her uh, in her relationship with Lewis and in you know the running of the household uh, that they shared, um, the relationship she had with her with Lewis's brother who also lived for some of that time in their home and their home was called the Kilns, um, so we'll refer to that from time to time. But uh, Mrs. Moore. Um, did not believe, did not understand Lewis's conversion, did not really appreciate it, uh, and really kind of resisted, you know, what that change, what that, the change that was happening in Lewis's life. And so um, that became, but nevertheless, Lewis remained loyal to her and uh, continued to care for her all the way to her dying day. I believe she died in 1951. Um, so about 30 years that they, that mm -hmm. they were together and maintained a household together. Um, and uh, really, you know, they, they, they suffered at each other's hands. Uh, and at the same time, I'm sure in the early stages, it was a, it was a, a life-giving relationship for the two of them. Again, thank you. Yeah.